Dear people watching and listening, Assalamu alaikum. Kindly like and share this video with your friends and family and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Please support my channel by contributing to my Patreon account so that I can continue making the audiobook series. Is the Bible God's Word? Start of Chapter 6 The Book Christened the New Testament Why According to? What about the so-called New Testament? Why does every gospel begin with the introduction, according to, according to? Why according to? Because not a single one of the wanted 24,000 copies extant carries its author's autograph. Hence the supposition according to. Even the internal evidence proves that Matthew was not the author of the first gospel which bears his name. And as Jesus passed forth tense, he, Jesus, saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he, Jesus, said unto him, Matthew, follow me, Jesus. And he, Matthew, arose and followed him, Jesus. Holy Bible, Matthew, chapter 9, verse 9. Without any stretch of the imagination, one can see that he's and the hymns of the above narration do not refer to Jesus or Matthew as its author, but some third person writing what he saw and heard. A hearsay account. If we cannot even attribute this book of dreams, as the first gospel is also described to the disciple Matthew, how can we accept it as the word of God? We are not alone in this discovery that Matthew did not write the gospel according to St. Matthew, and that it was written by some anonymous hand. J.B. Phillips concurs with us in our findings. He is the paid servant of the Anglican Church, a prebendary of the Chichester Cathedral, England. He would have no reason to lie or betray to the detriment of the official view of his church, refer to his introduction to the Gospel of St. Matthew. Phillips has this to say about its authorship. Early tradition ascribed this Gospel to the Apostle Matthew, but scholars nowadays almost all reject this view. In other words, St. Matthew did not write the gospel which bears his name. This is the finding of Christian scholars of the highest eminence, not of Hindus, Muslims and Jews who may be accused of bias. Let our Anglican friend continue. The author, whom we still can conveniently call Matthew, conveniently, because otherwise every time we made a reference to Matthew, we would have to say, the first book of the New Testament, chapter so and so, verse so and so, and again and again, the first book, etc. Therefore, according to J.B. Phillips, it is convenient that we give the book some name. So why not Matthew? Suppose it is a good a name as any other, Phillips continues. The author has plainly drawn on the mysterious cue which may have been a collection of oral traditions. What is this mysterious Q? Q is short for the German word Quelle, which means sources. This is supposed to be another document, a common source, to which our present Matthew, Mark and Luke had access. All these three authors, whoever they were, had a common eye on the material at hand. They were writing as if looking through one eye, and because they saw eye to eye, the first three Gospels came to be known as the Synoptic Gospels. Wholesale Cribbing But what about that inspiration business? The Anglican prebendary has hit the nail on the head. He is more than anyone else entitled to do so. A paid servant of the Church, an Orthodox Evangelical Christian, a Bible scholar of repute, having direct access to the original Greek manuscripts, let him spell it out for us. Notice how gently he lets the cat out of the bag. He, Matthew, has used Mark's gospel freely, which in the language of the school teacher has been copying wholesale from Mark. Yet the Christians call this wholesale plagiarism the word of God. 
Does it not make you wonder that an eye witness and an ear witness to the ministry of Jesus, which the disciple Matthew was supposed to be, instead of writing his own first-hand impressions of the ministry of his Lord, would go and steal from the writings of a youth, Mark, who was a ten-year-old lad when Jesus upbraided his nation? Why would an eye witness and ear witness like Matthew copy from a fellow Mark, who himself was writing from hearsay? The disciple Matthew would not do any such silly thing, for an anonymous document has been imposed on the fair name of Matthew. Plagiarism or Literary Kidnapping Plagiarism means literary theft. Someone copies verbatim, word for word, from another's writing and palms it off as his own, is known as plagiarism. This is a common trait amongst the 40 or so anonymous authors of the books of the Bible. The Christians boast about a supposedly common code among the writers of the 66 Protestant booklets and the writers of the 73 Roman Catholic booklets called the Holy Bible. Some common code there is for Matthew and Luke, or whoever they were, had plagiarized 85% word for word from Mark. God Almighty did not dictate the same wordings to the synoptists, one-eyed. The Christians themselves admit this, because they do not believe in a verbal inspiration, as the Muslims do about the Holy Qur'an. This 85% plagiarism of Matthew and Luke pales into insignificance compared to the literary kidnapping of the authors of the Old Testament, where a 100% stealing occurs in the so-called Book of God. Christian scholars of the caliber of Bishop Kenneth Gregg euphemistically call this stealing, reproduction, and take pride in it. Perverted Standards Dr. Scroggy most enthusiastically quotes in his book a Dr. Joseph Parker for his unique eulogy of the Bible. What a book is the Bible in the matter of variety of contents. All pages are taken up with obscure names, and more is told of a genealogy than of the Day of Judgment. Stories are half told, and the night falls before we can tell where victory lay. Where is there anything? in the religious literature of the world. To correspond with this, a beautiful nexus of words and phrases undoubtedly, it is much it is much ado about nothing, and rank blasphemy against God Almighty for authorizing such an embarrassing hodgepodge. Yet the Christians gloat over the very defects of their books, like Romeo over the mole on Juliet's lip. Nothing less than one hundred percent. To demonstrate the degree of plagiarism practiced by the inspired Bible writers, I asked my audience during a symposium at the University of Cape Town, conducted between myself and Professor Kumpstee, the head of the Department of Theology on the subject, Is the Bible God's Word? to open their Bibles. Some Christians are very fond of carrying their Bibles under their arms when religious discussions or debates take place. They seem to be utterly helpless without this book. At my suggestion, a number of the audience began ruffling the pages. I asked them to open chapter 37 in the book of Isaiah. When the audience was ready, I asked them to compare my Isaiah 37 with their Isaiah 37, while I read to see whether they were identical. I began reading slowly, verse 1, 2, 4. 10, 15, and so on, until the end of the chapter. I kept on asking after every verse if what I had been reading was identical with the verse in their Bibles. Again and again they chorused, Yeah, yeah. At the end of the chapter, with the Bible still open in my hands at the place from which I had been reading, I made the chairman to reveal to the audience that I was not reading from Isaiah 37 at all, but from 2 Kings 19, there was a terrible consternation in the audience. I had thus established 100% plagiarism in the Holy Bible. In other words, Isaiah 37 and 2 Kings 19 are identical word for word, yet they have been attributed to two different authors centuries apart, 
whom the Christians claim have been inspired by God. Who is copying from whom? Who is stealing from whom? The 32 renowned Bible scholars of the RSV say that the author of the Book of Kings is unknown. These notes on the Bible were prepared and edited by the Right Reverend David J. Fant, Lit D, General Secretary of the New York Bible Society. Naturally, if the most reverend gentlemen of Christendom had an iota of belief about the Bible being the Word of God, they would have said so, but they honestly, shamefacedly confess, author unknown. They are prepared to pay lip service to scriptures which could have been penned by any Tom, Dick or Harry and expect everyone to regard these as the word of God. Heaven forbid. No verbal inspiration. What have Christian scholars to say about the book of Isaiah? They say, mainly credited to Isaiah, parts may have been written by others. In view of the confessions of Bible scholars, we will not take poor Isaiah to task. Can we then nail this plagiarism on the door of God? What blasphemy! Professor Kumpsi confirmed at question time at the end of the aforementioned symposium that the Christians do not believe in a verbal inspiration of the Bible. So God Almighty had not absent mindedly dictated the same tale twice. Human hands, all too human had played havoc with this so-called word of God, the Bible. Yet Bible thumpers will insist that every word, comma, and full stop of the Bible is God's word. End of chapter 6